So an infinite word, we still have an alphabet with a finite number of letters. This time it's important. The, we have only finitely many uh, different letters. So here I will take two. You can take any finite number, but it shouldn't be infinite, otherwise different things happen. Uh, so infinite words. I write it, usually I write them W underline uh, on, the, um, when on a nice written document, like a computer typeset document, I would use a bold W. I would write something like this to denote, to remind you that this is an infinite word. But I won't make a bold letter every time here, so I will underline them. It's just that so you can quickly spot what is uh, infinite and what is finite. So an infinite word W formally is a function, a sequence of letters, so a function uh, from the natural integers into uh, your alphabet sigma and uh, I s usually take uh, zero at in the set of natural integers. So in particular the entrance of this building is on level zero. I have lots of arguments with locals about this. Um, and so, so what can we do with the infinite words? So first of all, I will change a little bit the notation because if it's still te technically it's a function, if I want to talk about the ith letter of a word, I can write this. This is just letter at position i. And if I want to talk of a factor, oops, it's going to fall down, something I can write i, i plus one, da da da, i plus uh, n minus one. So actually a factor is still the same thing as before, just inside an infinite word. And the important thing is that a factor is always finite. If I say u is a factor of w, all the time u is a finite word. So it has a length, here the length is n. But I, don't, I won't talk much about infinite words being inside others, so every time it will be like this. And of course a prefix is a factor that you find at the beginning, as usual. A uh, suffix would be a bit hard to define because that would be an infinite word, but okay, if you really need it, a suffix is an infinite word. Uh, so this sets the notation and um, okay, historically the first example of infinite words that were studied were the decimals of or the bits of some real numbers. You probably heard about questions like um, wh what can you find in the digits of pi? You, you read things like you can find a Hamlet or whatever other text you like in the digits of pi somewhere. Or maybe the question that uh, do we have, uh, if you write pi in binary, do you have equally many zeros and ones? Like it is a balanced number in some way. So all these questions actually don't talk much about p pi as a real number. They talk about pi as a word because they talk about the letters you see on pi, whatever the base. So this was the historical example. You also had... Um, some guy is uh, in German that I cannot pronounce the name, so I won't try, but you can look it up, uh, who was a um, chess world champion at some point and who asked himself the question, can you find an, infinitely going, uh, an infinite game of chess, given the rules of the time? Because you know that in chess we have special rules to avoid infinite games, like after some time if nothing happens, then it is a draw. And so the guy studied what rule exactly do you need uh, to avoid infinite chess games, and, uh, and so you'd turn out, uh, turn out seeing infinite words appear. But for now, I can give um, easier examples, uh, if you want to, to see an example of, uh, of an infinite word. Of course, there are periodic guys, uh, but I won't bore you with that. And no, otherwise, you can define them by recurrence. Something very common is I could write this. I could define a sequence f, where f0 equals a, so this time it's a sequence, like each fi is a word, f1 is ab, and fn plus 2 is fn plus, no, plus 2 I said. Concatenated, so fn plus 2 is fn plus 1 concatenated with fn. So this is a sequence of finite words, right? And each time you observe that um, fn is a prefix of 
f n plus 1 and the length rho. So this means that uh, everywhere in this sequence the first letter will be a. It will never change just because you, you can see directly on the equation here. Everywhere on this sequence the second letter will be a b all the time. And if you continue, if you evaluate f2, f3 and so on, so f2 will be a b a, f3 shall be a b a a b and so on and so forth, it's to infinity, I won't do it until the end. So maybe it's not very well aligned, but here you will have an a everywhere, here you will have a b everywhere, here you will have an a everywhere, here you will have an a everywhere, here a b everywhere and so on and so forth. So once a letter appears, it never changes. And therefore it makes sense to use some kind of, uh, you, you can define it formally with diagonal for instance, but to talk about the infinite word that you get at the limit. I will give a topology to make things precise in the next lecture next week, but for now we can just uh, accept that if we have a sequence of words like this that are extend each other and uh, which grow in length, this will converge to some sense into an infinite word. And to get the letters of this infinite word you just for instance take, you can define f underline, so this is the infinite version of f, i equal so here I mean the ith letter of fi. So you, for the, the letter 0 you take this, for letter 1 you take this, for letter 2 you take this, for letter 3 you take this, and so on and so forth. And like this it converges. And you, can, you have all kind of um, words that you can define by recurrence like this. So this word, can you guess its name? Fibonacci? Yes. Okay, it's f and the equation here is here. So this is called the Fibonacci word. Extremely classical example. When I had, uh, when I did my PhD and I visited my advisor and I told him, but what, um, is this true? Like I had a conjecture or something. I said, I want to think about this. The first thing he did was what happens on the Fibonacci word all the time. So this is, uh, this word has uh, all the properties in the world except the properties that you especially designed it not to have in some sense. It has uh, 35 de equivalent definitions and so on. Uh, and in particular it shows up if you try to modelize uh, priority queues or things like that. But I, won't, I, won't, I don't want to enter in this kind of depth. I will, I will just show you another example which is also extremely classical. Um, so it's a bit the same but Yes, okay, it's like this. So here I start with just a and I say that tn plus 1 is tn, tn bar, where the bar just means that you swap <coughs> the a and the b, like a bar equals b and b bar equals a. So you just take the negation, you copy, you take the negation. And it is the same, you can evaluate it. And here, once again, it's obvious that tn is a prefix of tn plus 1, and it's also obvious that the length will grow. So if you evaluate, you will find this, uh, and so on. It doesn't stop, of course. Uh, this is called the Chuemors word. Okay, for this one, uh, you could imagine generalizations where you, you do a rotation, like you have A, B, and C, A becomes B, B becomes C, and C becomes A. But th this is the, the most used one for, uh, for various reasons, because you have lots of theoretical problems where you ask yourself, I know that some words exist with this property. I want to find the minimal number of letters that is needed for this property to be true. I don't know if I make sense here. Like I, I know that some words exist in which you don't have w squared as a factor for any w non-empty. Well, what is the mean? And y people ask questions like, what is the minimal number of letters that you need to build an infinite word with this property having no w squared typically? And Chuey Morse is very useful in this theory because uh, it it, ha it has many interesting properties, and it has only two letters, which is pretty much the minimum that you can do. And for here, you can also imagine uh, generalization with more letters. It's called a Tribonacci word, and you make, can make fractals with it. Of course, 
Th th there is a very rich theory. I just want to show you that uh, we can make infinite words just with very simple recurrence. And still, uh, these are the most interesting examples of the theory, the most studied. Uh, this one is related with uh, what I explained about chess. Typically, uh, the guy who tried to make an infinite chess game uh, rediscovered the true more sequence. So actually, if I wanted to be honest, it should have 20 names here instead of two, but we have limited space and time. OK. So this is just to give you examples and convince you that such object exists. Uh, and we will use something a bit like this to study the Towers of Hanoi problem. So we will Im imagine another word, also defined by recurrence like this, which has a link with the uh, Tower of Hanoi problem. But first, um, I want to show you a, an a useful tool, which is called Morphisms of four on Words. So I can. I, will, I want to keep the examples. So this should sound familiar if you visited the seminar already. If I have a function new from sigma to sigma star. So for each letter, I give a word. Uh, typically, something like mu of a equals ab, mu of b equals ba. You can extend this function to finite words and infinite words. So typically, if I have uh, so technically, it should be only on letters, but I will allow myself to evaluate things like uh, mu of ABA, and how do I evaluate that? I just take the image of letters and I concatenate. So this would be ABBAAB, and more formally, mu of W0, WN minus 1 is just mu of W0, ta ta ta, mu of WN minus 1. And I will even allow myself ev uh, even th further things. If I have an infinite word, I can also take its image by a morphism, doing a bit the same, actually. If you have some infinite word w, then you can just take the image of the first letter, concatenate with the image of the second letter, and so on and so forth, two, three, four. And uh, this defines an infinite word. It's not very complicated to write a formal definitions by recurrence like this to check that it actually means something. Uh, and these morphisms, why do we call them morphisms, right? Because if you see this as a function with a star, it actually satisfies this equation for all x and all y. And so once again, the name morphism comes from the algebraic intuition. You can imagine uh, this as a, uh, the set of uh, finite words as a group, or let's say monoid, uh, and mu as a morphism of monoid because it, it's, uh, it's compatible with the concatenation relation. And it's, a, it's an if and only if. The functions satisfying these equations are exactly the one that we build by just taking images of letter and concatenating. All right, so I, this tool is very, very useful to... Um, the morphisms are very, very useful to talk about infinite words, actually. For now, I, 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 could, <coughs> I could have introduced them in the finite words lecture, but I introduced them here. For instance, we can express... Oops. We can express such uh, recurrence relations with morphisms, which makes things easier to work with. So I will move two and more here. Two and more. Okay. You can uh, you can show, and uh, actually we will do it because it's just a simple calculation. That okay. First, uh, m you can compose morphism and still get a morphism. All right. In particular, you can compose a morphism with itself and get the powers of that morphism. And I, I will actually, this is the, the key, this is the killer tool. This is why we like morphism, because you can take powers. So mu of the pow to the power 0 is just identity, and mu to the power 1 is, n, n plus 1, sorry, is mu power n composed with mu itself. Funny thing. 
Composition of morphism is associative. It, it has no impact what, in which order you take the... The order in which you take the composition has no impact at all. I mean, I mean that uh, mu1 circ mu2 mu3 is the same morphism as mu1 mu2, sorry, compound with mu3. You take the image of the letters actually, and you will. I, I, in you, sh you should check it for a single letter every time. Okay, uh, I uh, assume that uh, none of the letters are erased. I assume that the image of no letter is, an, is the empty word, uh, if it helps. Okay. Because, uh, yes, I forget to mention it. Because otherwise you can erase letters and bad things happen. Okay, not very important. Not very important, just that you can write things. You can use combinatorics on words to study morphisms, actually. This is what I wanted to slip. Indeed, it's not completely obvious, but it's not my point. Just we are stick to this, and but we will accept that this is also equal to this, which is the the weak version of this, and this is all that I actually need for this lecture. And now uh, you can show things like uh, T n is actually uh, with this morphism mu. Uh, so this belongs here. With this morphism mu, T n is the power of uh, the mu power n of a, and actually I will also need to show, but just an artifact of proof. Of b. So, why is this useful? Because actually, it's in general, it's much easier to work with morphisms uh, than with uh, recurrence relations like this. A morphism. Okay, it's a finite object. Okay, th this equation is also a finite object. But morphism is a finite classical object and we have lots of uh, knowledge about morphisms, like uh, algorithms to decide some things and, and so on and so forth. So usually we're happy when we can express something in terms of morphisms. There is a whole big theory that can help us starting from this point. If you have only recurrence relation like than this, it's less easy to handle. And usually you want to take back to this case. And uh, to write this is actually just, you, you pr to prove this, you need also to prove this together. It makes things much easier. And then you just write, you do a recurrence uh, in induction over n, and it's, it comes immediately, like induction. So mu zero of a is just a, all right? Mu zero of b is just b, which is a bar. Okay, nothing difficult. Um, and mu to the n plus 1 of a well using this you can decompose it as mu to the n of mu a which is equal to mu to the n of a b. So I just isolated one of the powers and applied it to get mu of nb. The composition of morphisms is still a morphism, so I can still use this equation. Mu n of a, so this is equal to mu n. So I can split in two. Mu, to mu power n is still, uh, is still a morphism. And now I can apply induction uh, hypothesis to replace this by this, this by this, and this is exactly the definition of Tn plus 1. And you should also prove this equation because at some point here, to transform this in this, I use this equation, but you prove it exactly the same. The calculation here is exactly the same, so you do kind of parallel induction where you, you prove both, uh, first, uh, both initialization phases and both uh, recurrence phases. So morphisms can express things, and in particular here, I want to give a name to this uh, limit thing. Okay. Because I, I, called, I called T with a bold letter, somehow we haven't 
use the topology yet, but somehow the limit of this sequence, because they are prefixes of each other, so I defined you how to compute this. And actually, I, I will denote this like this U to the omega of A. So what I mean is that when you have a sequence that you can write mu to the n of a, and uh, so n grows and grows and grows, and the, and the sequence converges to something, I will note it mu of omega of a. If you wish, some authors write mu infinity of a. This just means that you take a, then the image of a, then the image of the image, then the image three times, and so on and so forth, and this sequence has the good property, so it converges, and in this, in this case, we call the infinite word uh, that it reaches mu omega of a. Do I make sense here? Does it converge for any morphism? No, you should, uh, it doesn't work for any morphism. To, for this to be well defined, you should ensure that the underlying sequence uh, converges in the sense I gave before, and I will give conditions for this. I will tell you s which morphisms are nice and uh, allow you to, to check this immediately. But first, I want to, to know if, the, if just the, this definition is clear or if I should write it. How it cannot converge? Uh, mu of a equals epsilon, mu of b equals epsilon. Well, it could converge uh, to it could converge to a finite word. Ah, okay. But but I don't. But here I when I write this, I implicitly state that this is an infinite word. Okay. If if it converges to a finite word, I'm not interested. But what we decided that morphisms will not erase letters. Yes, we decided. So even like this, you could actually. Uh, do something more like this. And then if you start from a letter, because when I take a fixed point, I start from a letter. Then you will do A, B, A, B. The length won't grow, and so you will have problems. Uh, even if you... No. Okay. So, okay. So if, since you're interested in the conditions, uh, I can explain a sufficient condition. Uh, call it a lemma, if you wish. So mu is a morphism. In full generality, you don't need to have the same alphabet here. But if you want to compose a morphism with itself, then you, you would need it. So mu uh, a morphism, a a letter. Then mu if, if you have this. Mu. A U. So mu of A should start with an A, and uh, no image should be empty. Then mu of omega exists. So if you want mu of omega to exist, you should check that mu of a starts with a and has something. Uh, this thing is non-empty. So mu of a starts with a and with uh, something non-empty after, and other letters do not erase. Like other letters have non-empty images. And if you have these two conditions, and it is enough for the sequence, uh, for the fixed point to exist. I will explain why we call that a fixed point, uh, because basically what you need to prove is that um, first mu n plus n of a is a prefix of mu uh, n plus 1 of a, and so to prove this you just do an induction. Uh, for the first step a is a prefix of mu a Because I explicitly required it here, okay? And uh, if mu n, you suppose that mu n is a prefix. So now mu n plus one of a. Once again, what it is? It is mu n of mu of a, which is mu n a u 
And since it's a morphism, you can split. Okay, and here uh, I should also check that um, the length of this word grow towards inf to infinity, but it's the case because here you have something non-empty. So at each step you add more content, and so in the end... Well. So this is sufficient condition, and actually this is good enough for our purposes. The, uh, check this, to check this for all the morphisms we like. Um, and so it is, the, it is the case typically here. You can check. All right. And okay. When um, don't, don't look it up on the internet yet if you want to have some fun. But when students, you are very nice with me. But when students are not nice, I uh, ask them the following. Pro I give them the following problem. So it's not against you. It's a bit bad of me, but okay. So if you, if you really have nothing to do, um, I would be interested to have an um, efficient algorithm that the algorithm is as follows. The problem is you are given, you have two morphism, two morphisms, We n I noted them with uh, Greek letters usually, so say mu and nu. Uh, no, this is sorry, mu and nu. Greek writing is not that good for me. Uh, and can you find, you, I want an efficient algorithm to find a non-empty word, w, such that well, the images are equal. Of course, uh, you could insert the empty word, but the, 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 that's cheating. Um, so the, the morphisms are finite objects because you just receive, you know, an array with. Uh, you could imagine you are on. You work with an alphabet uh, zero one, for instance, and so you have an array. Uh, cell 0 contains the image of 0, cell 1 contains the image of 1, so it's perfectly finite object, so an algorithm can have it as an input. It even has a size, it's just the sum of the length of the images. And so now, the goal is to find an efficient algorithm um, given this input, and the size of the input here is the size of the morphisms, I mean the sum of the length of all the image of the letters. So you have no idea about what W is, except that it's not empty. You have no information whatsoever, but you try to find it. So if you look it up on the internet, it's not fun, but otherwise you can try to bring me your algorithms. And even if you, if you don't find an algorithm, you can try to take a guess at what would be the complexity class, at least. What you think, if you really cannot imagine uh, an efficient algorithm, can, you can try to bet what could be the fastest thing, is this NP complete or not, it's, it's things like that. Excuse me. But for now I promised that we would uh, deal with the puzzle of Hanoi Towers and now the good we know enough about morphisms to talk about the Hanoi Towers. Um, so I recall that uh, you ha in the Hanoi, Hanoi Tower puzzles you have three rods like this. Uh, some people draw this here. Uh, with disks, so I'm very bad at drawing so I won't try to draw too much, but initially you have disks, so I should make the base much larger, that are slipped in like this. And classically, you want to move all the disks from this uh, rod to this rod, but the invariant is that each rod should be sorted all the time. In other terms, you cannot put a big disk on top of a small disk. Every time, the only thing you're allowed to do is to put a small disk on top of a big disk. And uh, now the goal is to move all the disks in the right order then here. And of course, this is temporary storage in some sense. So what's the classical solution for this? Do you, you, hmm? 
Yes. So uh, the algorithm is something like, so let's, let's give names. I have very precise convention. Yes, like this. So let's give names. We have rod 1, rod 2, and rod 3. Say you want to move things from uh, whichever you like. It will be important afterwards, but for now. Let's say you want to move things from rod 1 to rod 3. You, you want to move n disks, which are initially like this, from rod 1 to rod 3. Well, as you said, recursively, if it is an algorithm, you move n minus 1 disks from rod 1 to rod 2, say. Then you move the last disk uh, from rod 1 to rod 3. And finally, you recursively again move uh, n minus disks, n minus 1 disks, sorry, from rod 2 to rod 3. And the base case is when you have only one disk, it's trivial. Or you can say that for zero disk, you do nothing. OK. And you can prove, uh, we won't do it here because we're interested in infinite thing in any case, but you can prove that this is optimal. Like you might find an equivalent solution, but it won't be shorter. This is the minimum number of moves that you can uh, make. And now the point is to uh, try to modelize that uh, problem and that solution using um, words and morphisms and see what happens. And I should actually uh, mention this. Uh, so I based the, this part of the lecture on, on this paper. So I would cite the authors here. So what we discuss from now is from Alouche, Asturian. Randall and Shalit. Um, and it's 1994. And these two, uh, the, the, these two on the left are two uh, big names of this domain. All right, so let's start. I think that we remember this. So, uh, first I need to, um, what the hell, Wait. Uh, we need to use words, so we give interpretation for letters. Uh, I will use an alphabet with uh, six letters, and the letters are going to represent this. For instance, A means that I move the top disk from here to here. Okay, A bar will be the, op the opposite, and okay, bar will be the opposite every time. Uh, B moves like this, and B bar like this. Okay, and as you can guess, C move like this, C bar moves like this. And now uh, I can translate this in, in, in terms of words, actually. Um, for, for, for this I will define the handy morphism. Uh, this just renames letters. So Bear with me for a second, I write the definition. If this thing doesn't break again. It does, okay. So the morphism I give you will make some kind of rotation. I will write it first and then explain how it works. So sigma of A equals B, sigma of B equals C, sigma of C equals A. So just from this, I think you can guess what it does, more or less how we will use it. And the same with bars. Sigma of A bar equals... <coughs> well, basically uh, B bar, sigma of B bar will be C bar, and sigma of C bar will be A bar. All right. I won't write it down, but this morphism has an inverse. We can talk about uh, sigma minor power minus 1, which does exactly the reverse transformation. 
So you can check this is a permutation over letters and it has an inverse permutation. And now, what wh wh why is this useful? Suppose that um, we have some finite word over um, sigma star. So sigma now is this six letter alphabet. And suppose some word moves n disks from rod 1 to rod 2. Can you guess what sigma of w will do? Yes, if I'm not mistaken. All right, yes, moves n disks from 2 to 3. Sigma uh, square, so sigma of sigma of w moves from 3 to 1. And uh, sigma minus 1, which is actually equal to sigma square, because if we do this one more time, so sigma cube of w is w itself. So actually, uh, sigma, uh, sigma minus 1 is the same as sigma 2. So we have sigma, we have sigma minus 1, so we can, move, we can change the solution one way or another. And now we're going to take a convention that's going to be useful. So we should choose. We have a choice, but I want to be consistent. If n is odd, n to 2, OK. So suppose we want to solve the puzzle the following way. We have n disks. And if n is odd, we want to move the disks from 1 to 2. And if n is even, then we, wa we want to move the disks from 1 to 3. So th th that's a bit weird of us, but OK, we don't lose much by taking this convention. The problem doesn't become much easier if you just change the destination. I mean, it's completely symmetric. So this is just a convenience for us. And now uh, I call Hn a solution that, that's something, a word over sigma, over sigma that solves the problem, that moves um, the disk where, where I want according to it. Do I make sense up to now? And we had an algorithm written here. OK, I, re I, I erased it. But we can rewrite it uh, in terms now with dysmorphisms and a bit of recurrence. So I said that if you have zero disk, you have nothing to do. All right, like this. Uh, we even saw that if you have only one disk, to then it's not, it's not expensive to write this. If we have only one disk, we can move it directly from here to here. One is odd, so it's consistent. And now if I have something, I have a large number of disks to move, what can I do? Well, I can start by solving the, um, the problem um, with one less disk. This is what we do, did initially. And then it depends. This is why I wrote brace here. Uh, typically, imagine. So let's say n is even. If a is even, then n plus 1 is odd. So we want to move everybody from 1 to 2. We called hn. So what hn did is that it, um, it moved everybody from 1 to 3, because n is even. Now I can move from 1 to 2 using c bar. And now I have the last disk. OK, so everybody moved. Now we are, so far we're in this configuration. We have the biggest disk here. And we have all the other ones here. So we need to move for 3 to 2. And do we have this? No. How does it work? 
Yes, we have B, but I want to use a recursive call now because we have many of them, so I want to use uh, HN again. I wrote, le let's check. Oh no, excuse me, I, I got that backwards, excuse me. L let me start again. So if n plus 1 is even, so if we want to solve something, we n plus 1 is even, we want to move things from 1 to 3. We want to move things from 1 to 3. Oh, something is wrong. Basically, I wrote this, if you want to help me check. And Hn, A sigma of Hn, if n plus 1 is odd. With the idea that we do the same thing as the previous algorithm. So if n plus 1 is even, what does this thing do? Hn is odd, so it moves things from 1 to 2 then it moves, it should be A here. And then it works. And here it should be C bar. All right. So what do we do? If we have something to solve, like, suppose n plus 1 is even, so we want to send things to 3. First, we, 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 recur we make our recursive call. And since we use this handy convention, it will send everything to 2. Then we use the letter A, so we send the last disk here, and then we re make the recursive call again, but instead of having from 1 to 2, we have from 2 to 3, because we, we observe this with this morphism. And now it works, I just had this backward. And similarly, if n plus 1 is odd, it does exactly the same, it moves uh, things to the temporary storage 3, then moves the disk to 2 and moves back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first observation, okay, it's not very useful observation, but it ca it, in terms of efficiency, uh, computing this is faster than com computing the previous algorithm that we had. For a very simple reason, um, in the previous algorithm, you had two recursive calls that a priori were independent, like you really had, the, you really had to do one and then the other. Here, like you, like what you can do is you can compute Hn uh, with a recursive call, and then you can use it here and use it again here. Instead of paying a whole recursive call, you just pay a linear cost to apply this letter-to-letter -letter transformation. Well, it turns out it doesn't help in terms of, compl of complexity because the size of the output is exponential. So in any case, you just because the size of the output is exponential and you need to write, an ex you need to write the output, your algorithm will be exponential time in both cases, so the complexity is not much better. But still, you can shave off a few milliseconds if you really need to solve a lot of uh, Hanoi Tower problems with very high n. So now we, um, we can modelize this problem, among others. And so if we can say things about uh, these words, uh, then we can say things about the Hanoi Tower problem. I promised infinite words and um, an infinite Hanoi Tower, so let's see how to do this. And when do we when do we stop? Uh, half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. Uh, why do you say the output is exponential? The complexity is uh, n squared, isn't it? Not sure it is, because in any case, l just compute the length of this word. So this is one, and this is twice n length of hn plus 1. So just the length of what you have to print uh, is exponential. So you have no chance to compute this in, uh, in, uh, in less than exponential time just because you have to print the output, at the very least. And it turns out that both algorithms match this bound. They both take not much more than just printing the output. So maybe in practice there is a difference. I didn't have time to implement and to try for you, but I le left it as an exercise in the notes. But yes, you have no chance to solve this in less than exponential time, and for those who are looking, you have no chance for this either. Um, 
And so now I want to give another description, which was observed by these four very small people whose I wrote the name a bit before. Uh, there is, as before, here we have a recurrence relation with the morphism inside, but okay. Uh, there is a way to write this purely in terms of morphisms, which will help for some uh, upcoming results. And the morphism is as follows. It's a bit more complicated. Sigma. So I will call it phi or f for you. Phi b is, I never remember, c b bar and phi c is b a bar. And you should also give the letters, the images for the converse. A, C, C, B, B. And now I claim that, uh, well, claim something precise actually. So we will need this, we will need, oh, hmm, we will need everything. Okay, maybe we don't need this. You've wrote, you will remember this or you will uh, have it in your notes? I can erase it. I have it in my notes. Can I erase this? Uh, probably, yes. Well, okay. In any case, actually the, the point is that it's not extreme, uh, extremely important because now we have this definition and this definition and I'm going to see there is an, an equivalence somehow between them. So the exact meaning of the letters doesn't matter anymore. You just remember that ABC is a cycle that does identity and that A is the opposite of A bar and the exact... Now we are finished with this precise thing. And so now we can... Right here... The theorem of this paper, well, the small th there is a small theorem and a big theorem. So the small theorem is that h of n plus 1, so of course it will depend if it's um, even or odd, phi of h n a, if if whom n is even this time, and phi of h n b if n is odd. And why I claim that we could solve the infinite Hanoi Tower problem with this because basically, you can now consider uh, phi omega of A, which is H1. And uh, so the, the you can consider it because phi of A starts with an A. It has a non-empty suffix after that. All the other letters have non-empty images. So this morphism has a fixed point. And since we have this, it means that this fixed point um, has all the HNs as prefixes. So all the solutions to the Hanoi Tower problem for all Ns are prefixes of uh, this infinite word. So in a sense, if you, you could start solving the Hanoi problem and then as soon as you solved it, uh, a genie adds one more disk in your input. So now you have one disk left and uh, all you already sorted is still sorted, but as soon as the, the input rod is empty, a genie adds something even bigger. It, you could continue by following, you could continue over and over by just following exactly this procedure and it would work. This is the interpretation of infinite Hanoi problem where the genie, uh, bad genie add uh, a new disk every time you rip the last one. And we can show this, and it's okay. Never extremely complicated. I think you could you probably guess it. Uh, you, we just write equation and we write. But 
one thing that we should observe and that I will leave as an exercise is that we can somehow commute in the sense that in what sense? Yes, in this sense. But here it doesn't commute exactly. Yes, you have a sigma minus 1 of phi of w here. And we can also do the converse thing, like phi of sigma minus 1 is equal to sigma of phi. I let you check this later. Uh, basically, the trick is that all of these things are morphisms, so it is enough to check it for letters. So it's a bit of computer calculation. You can probably convi convince a computer to do it for you, if you trust your computer enough. But you just check this for each letter, see that it's indeed equal, and then since it's morphism, it passes immediately to words. And then the rest is just uh, an induction. So we should prove um, by induction these two facts actually in parallel somehow. So let me, let me try. You write actually this phi of hn of a. What is it? hn, uh, we can expand the definition h n minus 1 so here i should uh, i say that i said that n is even i consider the case where n is even so okay the base case works because h0 is the empty word and h n plus 1 is matches like this uh, how does it, mm, that can work mm, uh, as we said uh, mm, ah. no. h0 h0 is the empty word and um, phi of h0, because n is even, a is equal to just a, which is indeed h1. Now, h1, uh, 1 is odd, so phi of h1, b, is phi of a, b, and it is a, c, b. And I let you, let you check that the, if you evaluate H2 using this algorithm, you will find the same thing. So this is the base case. You should do it for 0 and for 1, because our recurrence hypothesis will work both for n and n plus 1, because we're going to... Like, if we're in the even case, we're going to use the recurrence hypothesis in the odd case and vice versa. So if you write this completely formally, you should make your recurrence like this. But I want just... It, you will see the calculation and it will, it, hopefully, it will uh, follow immediately. So what I want to do, in this case, n is e I, I do the case where n is even and you will see the case where n is odd is exactly symmetric. So if a is even, I try to evaluate this, so I expand the definition of hn. Uh, where is the definition of hn? Here. So hn is, I said that H, uh, n is even, so it should be odd, so it should be like this, yes. n is even, so here I will express this in terms of n minus 1. So here my plus 1 is n minus 1. Well, it's a bit messy, but in the end you get this. Oops, excuse me. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Difficult. All right. Yes, of course, of course. Thanks. And then, since it is this is a morphism, I can split. Yes, I know it's a bit uh, confusing because oh, whom is even and who is odd. It should be a, isn't it? Huh? Because m. n is even. No, uh, so it's here, n, n, n plus 1 is, e n is even, but here my n is e this n plus 1. Yes. So, so this is even, oh. so and since this is even, ah, uh, yes, you're right. n plus 1 is even, so it should be a. All right. So in the odd case, you will have a c bar here, but as I said, symmetric. Okay, my bad. Uh, you sure?
wait. Okay, uh, let, let me try anyway, but I think we, uh, I, I mix up something somewhere once again, sorry. N minus one. So the plan is to split it in two and to take the image. All right, and um, I can actually swap the sigma and the phi mm -hmm. up to uh, replacing it with a sigma minus one. So I don't touch this one. I don't touch this one. Uh, this stays the same as well, and this I swap like this. And now I can um, move this inside, uh, just because this is the... Um, if I put here the image of A instead, then it, it will be equal again. So I, I will do it here immediately. So it should be C. Uh, no. Should be C or what? No, it should be B. It should be B. My bad. So by now you can apply a recurrence hypothesis, actually, if I'm not mistaken. You can. Um, Phi of h minus one a is uh, h n plus h n plus one minus one, so h n. Then you get a c bar. Then you get uh, sigma minus one of this, which is also by the other hypothesis of recurrence, h n. And why do I get a minus one here? I don't know. Oh, yeah, because I got it wrong here, probably. Yes, I forgot to minus one exactly here. It cannot be, they are symmetric, so here it cannot be the same sigma, otherwise you would get so sorry. There, this minus one was missing is in this definition. And so now by definition it is hn plus one. In the other case you write exactly the same equation, you get exactly the same behavior and in the end you have this. So not, 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 not fascinating calculation, but it's not very complicated. And as you can see, if I had asked you since the beginning, can you imagine an infinite word uh, that will solve the Hanoi Tower for as many disks as possible, like uh, an arbitrary large amount of disks, it's not completely trivial to find. And even if we know the trick, uh, ima uh, like realizing this morphism is not completely trivial either. But OK, makes things hold much easier. So this is the kind of uh, reasoning that morphisms allow us to do, typically. You will, it makes it make in induction work in much, a uh, much more smooth way. OK, so that was for the infinite um, uh, Hanoi Tower problem. Uh, one thing that could, could be said, uh, but we won't have time to prove it here, is about uh, pattern avoidance. So I get back to chess for a minute. I mentioned that in chess you have rules that are designed to break uh, infinite games. And one of the rules you probably know is something like you shouldn't see three times the same position with exac exactly rigorously the same position because otherwise the game is declared a draw. Technically if a player asks to the arbiter, but okay. And um, this is an example of a much richer theory, which we call the um, formula avoidance. And so many people ask them questions like this, like, do, do we can, can we find such pattern in such words? Typically, one question could be, can you solve the Hanoi Tower problem as arbitrarily far, like uh, infinitely like this, will, while never doing twice the same sequence of moves? Which means while never having, this is an example I have, question would be whether, um, so let's take now the infinite one. So has, does, 
has a factor w square for some non-empty w. So why is this question natural? So because um, for, for, for now it's just recreative mathematics question. It's like to make the problem more difficult. In general, you have something called Ramsey theory. Ramsey theory is initially about graphs, tells you that if you take bigger and bigger graphs, at some point you will find something in this graph. Um, some things are unavoidable. You will find, if you take very, very, very large graphs and you make them random enough, I mean, you don't just take path or something, you will necessarily find, uh, I don't know, a clique of some size or things like that. So if you take an arbitrary graph, a random graph, large enough with very high probability, you will always think a pat see some pattern occur somewhere. Uh, so this is very large and explore theory. It has many deep insights. And the version for words is this. The version for words is, can we find such patterns like squares or uh, uh, factors of the form W, U, W, or anything like this in such words? And we re realize that um, if you add constraints on the number of letters, some patterns are avoidable or unavoidable. And, the, and so the... Um, fun mathematics version of this question is things like can you play the Hanoi Tower games without doing never ever twice the same sequence of moves in a row? So it turns out that the answer is yes, uh, um, in the sense that you, ne you don't have such factors. You can play, you can actually play Hanoi Towers uh, without never doing twice the same, uh, the same sequence of moves in a row and you can play arbitrarily long. It's not completely trivial to prove, so I will skip it for now. It is the big theorem I mentioned from this paper. But uh, this is where uh, using morphisms is actually important. Uh, you will suppose, typically, that you found a, squares, a W square somewhere, but you know that you can be written like this, and so now you can decompose your word according to the images of the letters and do clever things. The key fact that I forgot to mention and which is very general, it has nothing to do with Hanoi Towers. But the key fact that you shall use all the time in, if you do these things is that mu of mu to the omega of A is equals to mu of the omega of A. In other terms, it's a fixed point. The, I called it the fixed point of mu sometimes for this reason. And to convince yourself of this, you just um, evaluate it actually. And you, you do exactly the same calculation that we did when we showed that it converged to something. And you will realize that you f end up with the same. So now you can always take the inverse image of something because since uh, this word is a fixed point, you can take also the inverse image. Like you can, if you have some factor, if the factor is well aligned, it is the image of some other factor smaller by this morphism. And now you can make your recurrence work like this and many, many problems succeed that way. All right, um, good for everybody? Yeah. Try to make it more interesting than the first part. Uh, and now, so I said a few words about pattern avoidance, uh, so we can continue with this. To get more general, uh, we can try to build, because here I claim that this word has no square factor. We can try to build a word that uh, has no square factors. So let's try. Uh, no, sorry. I give, take back my good old AB alphabet. And now I want to build a word that is square free. We call it square free. It means exactly like I had here, that it has no factor of the form W square for some non-empty W. Let's try. This very general fact is still here. So I could start with A or with B. It has no importance because I could rename letters in any case. Now if I put an A here, I'm stuck because I have AA A and this is a square factor, so I cannot. Therefore, I must put a B here. Now I continue again. If I put a B here, then I have a square again, so I have to put an A. So it starts well. It seems like we have no choice and we can write deterministically in some point. But here, what can I put? Only nothing, yes, because if I put A, I get this is a square, and if I put B, I get this, and it is also a square. 
So, uh, key fact, it is impossible to build an um, infinite word or even a f finite word of more than four letters which avoids the square, which is square-free. If the alphabet is of size 2. If the alphabet is of size 2, exactly. It turns out that for alphabet of size 3 we can. But I'm interested in something slightly different. Uh, so, impossible with sigma equals 2, impossible to avoid factors of this size. So we could do two things. Either we could do, as you suggest, we, we could look at what happens for three letters, and uh, you will find that you can always continue, and then you should try to formalize it, and it's not completely trivial, but you can do it. Another thing you can do is uh, whether, for two letters, is it possible to avoid W cube. It looks like uh, uh, for an alphabet of size n, uh, we can avoid uh, mm, uh, w to the power n minus 1, but not. Uh, what do you mean? You mean that if you have an alphabet of size n, you can avoid. A, a M minus one is not avoidable. You will meet. It. You will have the same problem as here. Is that what you say? I, I'm not sure. I understand actually. Okay, no, but because actually there are very general results and also very general conjectures about these kind of things, about how to avoid squares, cubes, and all kinds of patterns. Uh, other because here, I, um, you could uh, also ask question how to avoid with two different uh, variables here. And there is also all kinds of questions about what letters you need to avoid which patterns with how many variables. If you have more variables, it becomes different, and so on and so forth. And many, many questions and conjectures are uh, open and closed. Uh, it's a very active research subject, actually. There were talk. Uh, maybe in September at Yandex at the Extremal Combinatorics seminar about this. An invited lecturer talked about this. And it was very nice talk, by the way. Um, okay, and for now, uh, um, among all these questions that we can ask, I wanted to cover uh, is it possible to avoid W cube with an alphabet of size 2? Uh, so, in other terms, if you have a chess, stupid chess game, with only two possible moves, like you get your knight out and in and out and in, is it possible to avoid not exactly three times the same position, but three times the same sequence of moves? So if you start from the same initial position, it gives you... And it turns out the answer is yes. And it turns out that uh, the um, good word for this is the Chewy-Morse word. I mentioned in the beginning that guy playing chess. Good. Uh, found it independently. And this is what I want to cover for, for um, the end, is to show that Chewy Morse is cube 3, and uh, I will tell you it is even less well prepared than the rest, so you can imagine how it will be. So actually it will help me. So I, I remind you the Chewy Morse word, so we can define that T0 is A and Tn plus 1 is equal to Tn, Tn bar, and you remember the bar is inversing A and B, or equivalently it is equal to mu A of uh, yeah, just this, where is AB and mu of B is BA. And we proved that these two things are equivalent. So, first, Actually, we can somehow um, notice something that all the ti's here are prefixes of the Chewy Morse word. So Chewy Morse, I will write it with a big underlined t like this. Um, all these ti's are prefixes of the Chewy Morse word by definition. So if there is a w cube somewhere. It will appear in a prefix, because, okay, just it appears. And so it will appear in some t. C 
say T n. And I will take the minimum n. So we suppose we take the minimal n. So before, it's kind of a hidden recurrence, if you wish. Before n, we have no, uh, we are sure that we have no q is factored in the ti for i lesser. It is not very complicated to check for the first values of uh, t0, t1, t2, etc., that you don't have a cube whatsoever inside. So th this is well uh, founded. This, is a, this reasoning is initialized. And now uh, I will forget this for a second. I will prove a little lemma. And I need a de definition, actually. So I, I have a function e say of w0, wn minus 1, it's I just take the, even, the, et, the letters at even positions. So basically, this means that we have w0, w2, w4, tac, until wn minus 2, say. It depends if it's even or odd, but you get the idea. You just remove half of the letters, 1 over 2. Here you keep w0, and of course, odd. You can guess is w1, w3, w5, and so on, w n minus 2, or n minus 1, it depends, the n depends on whether it's even or odd. And it turns out, so this is lemma, that E of Tn is actually equals to Tn minus 1, and similarly, O of Tn is Tn minus 1 bar. And you start to get used, this is a <laughs> recurrence, of course. So for n equals 1, we have uh, E of T1 is AB, and so this is A. Well, here I call them even and odd, so it's important that I start counting letters at 0. 0 is an even number, so Otherwise, you should reverse the convention. And odd, and so this is actually t0 of ab is equal to b, and this is t0 bar. Nothing difficult. And by induction, e of tn plus 1 is equal to what? Is equal to e tn tn bar by definition. And here it is important to notice that all the ti's except t0 uh, have uh, even length because uh, each time you double the length. So except for t0, but t0 is initialization, we don't care. For all the other cases, we have even length. So here it's not exactly a morphism, but still we can split because it will behave nicely since everybody has the right length. Now, um, you can notice that uh, having a bar inside of outside doesn't change. If I just swap and take half, or if I take half and swap, I will get the same result. So I can write this. Uh, and uh, apply recurrence hypothesis. with a bar here, and by definition, this is Tn. And the odd case goes exactly the same. Once again, perfectly symmetric, and so on and so forth. So now I'm moving back, well, to, uh, so I have this lemma. Let's put it in a square. I'm moving back to my affair here. I took the minimal n such that Tn had um, Ah, right. This is where it's going to be complicated. You have two cases, actually. Uh, and one of them is goes well, and for the other, actually, we don't quite have time, but I can uh, leave it an, as an exercise, and, uh, and it will be in the notes. But just to give you a taste of what happens in the end. So we took a minimal hand, and suppose you should distinguish two cases, which I didn't do, that the length of W is even. In this case, since you have W cube factor of um, 
w cube is factor of tn. Oops. If you just look at the even, uh, the, um, it depends. So if w cube starts at an even position, then you can consider e of tn, which is tn minus 1. And this will also contain a cube. Because w is of even length and w, and it's, and w cube started at an even position. If uh, w cube starts at an odd position, then you can consider um, O of tn, which is tn minus 1 bar. But t minus 1 bar contains a cube only if t, mi t minus n contains a cube. So for the same reason, you have a w cube that starts at um, odd position. W itself has even number of letters. So when you keep only one letter of row 2, you still get a cube in the lesser, uh, in the previous term. And so your minimal n was not actually minimal. So this is the easy case. For the odd case, you should work a little bit more, so I will skip it for now. But it gives you an idea of how you use, uh, pro how you prove uh, such um, uh, results about avoidability. And usually it goes a bit like this, but with morphisms. Like you have uh, some fixed point of morphism. You suppose you have a cube or whatever you want to avoid. You take the minimal uh, occurrence, and then you take the reverse image by the morphism. You can do that, you're in a fixed point. And you get, once again, uh, and you get, once again, uh, the, the pattern which, which is even smaller than the one you're supposed to be minimal. And like this, you can check if, uh, indeed, there exists an infinite game of chess or not, or stuff like that. So I think that's it. Um, just a few concluding remarks. The things that we don't, didn't cover uh, included a factor complexity. So there are a lot of... Um, work to try to understand what complex means for a word. We have big experts of this here, probably you heard of Komogorov complexity or stuff like that. Uh, you have many, many notions trying to formalize the intuition that some words, even infinite, are simpler than others. And one of them is factor complexity. Factor complexity is a function. You have a word, you count how many different factors of length n it has. You get a function of n and Given this function of n, you can, uh, you can say things about your word. Typically, you can uh, check whether a word is periodic or not just by counting its factors or stuff like that. So, and it's also another whole theory of what you can say about words like this. So that's it. Next time, uh, if we are in shape, we will try to approach, I can promise we will do it completely formally, but we'll try to approach the Banach-Tarski uh, paradox, where you start with one ball and you finish with two, just by cutting in six different pieces and moving out. Yes, yes, this is combinatorics on words. You don't know it yet. Okay, and now I'm sure you will come, you see. But yes, I promise it's, com it's okay, not only, but the key idea is combinatorics, like this. And then, of course, you, sh the, you should work to translate this key idea into geometry because you had a combinatorial idea. But the, um, the combinatorial idea is really clear. You see it, you say, okay, this is going to work. And then you work a lot to convert it to geometry, and this is where it's not fun, and this is where you use the axiom of choice, and so on. But the key idea I will show, at least. Hope it will be interesting. And then, uh, if you still survive, the second part of next time, I will show you a bit of what I actually do uh, here, I mean, uh, as research problems.